I heard a story which is not so well known. I think it's not so well known. I'm going to begin to bring it with this story. And I think it's a story that Ramnisna Tibet tell. I think that that's the source of the story. That the Friedrich Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe was living in Russia. And he was being by Zanefesh. I mean, he really was. The Friedrich Rebbe was not planning how, how the situation in the Soviet Union was going to end. Friedrich Rebbe saw what he, what he considered the Shasa Shmad, a time of Shmad. Shmad means where the attack on Yiddishkeit is not uh, superficial. It's not an attack on something specific for a particular purpose. But it's an attack at the very heart, at the very soul, at the very essence of Yiddishkeit. And the, when you have such a situation, you need somebody to set a course of absolute Mercedes Nefesh, unreasonable readiness for Mercedes Nefesh. It's happened before in our history, you know, the story of Hanukkah and the Hashminoyim is a classic example of people who, who realized that there was a, was a circumstance that demanded Mercedes Nefesh and they did it. Rabbi Akiva, right, the stories of the Gemara, Rabbi Akiva, where he was Mesa Nefesh. The Friedrich Rebbe saw the time in which he lived at such a moment, and he undertook to be Meisa Nefesh, and he included in the Mesiris Nefesh his Talmidim, the Tmimim, the Chsidim. But his attitude towards his situation was one of complete self-sacrifice. So this is a story that I heard, that a while before he was arrested, he was arrested to Zvot Sivan, he was arrested to the 90, this is the 95th anniversary, of the Friedrich Rebbe's arrest on liberation. So uh, he was arrested on the 15th of Sivan. They held him in prison for 18 and a half days until Gimel Tammuz. Gimel Tammuz, he was allowed, it was a Sunday. Gimel Tammuz was allowed to leave his incarceration, but he was forced into exile. The exile was supposed to be for three years. He was in exile for nine days or 10 days. On Yibay's Tammuz, he was told unofficially, and Gimel Tammuz, he was told officially that that he's free to go, and the Friedrich Rebbe went back home. And of course, the end of the story is that months later, for all kinds of reasons, the Rebbe had to leave Russia altogether. The Rebbe had to leave Russia. So the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, was living a life of Mercedes Nefesh, leading up to that. His whole life was a life of Mercedes Nefesh. This is the story that I heard. That he called in the Rebbe, our Rebbe, the Rebbe's well Gesundheit, like, our Rebbe, who was a young man. The Rebbe was a relatively young man. The Rebbe was not yet married, the Tafresh Peizayin, the Rebbe had just turned 25, approximately. And the Friedrich were called in the Rebbe and he asked him Shailis, halacha questions, that if I'm gonna be in a place, in a prison, he described what a prison is like, you share a room with other people, and there's a latrine, you understand how prisons are in Russia. <laughs> there's a latrine, there's a toilet, and there's no separation, and there's no mechitzis, and there's no respect, so it becomes all kinds of halakha questions about how you david and how you learn and how you do mitzvahs. So this is a story that I heard that the Rebbe asked the Friyadik Rebbe, how, do you, how should he behave if he's in such a condition? And the Rebbe had to, our Rebbe had to answer his questions on a level of halakha, tell him practically how each aspect of his situation should be addressed. And the Friyadik Rebbe told him as follows, says, Me desnit I'm asking you questions in halakha, I want you to know that the questions I'm asking you are for me, not practical. Because I'm going to be Mesa Nefesh for Kaitse Shal Yud, the Rebbe told him. The Friedrich Rebbe said to the Rebbe, I am going to be uncompromising about anything at all, under all conditions. So he says, I'm asking the questions, even though practically I'm not going to do what you're paskening in halacha. So what's the point of asking the question if you're not going to listen? So the Rebbe said this expression, this is the Maish of Yehel, the Friedrich Rebbe said to the Rebbe, Ich will zen wie a Hasidish Arof tracht. That was the Rebbe's expression. I want to see how a Hasidish Arof thinks, how a Hasidish Arof thinks. And I want to tell you a second story, which will qualify the first story. That in Tzadik Gimel, in 1933 approximately, the Rav of Leningrad passed away. Leningrad had a Rof. Leningrad was a big city. And before the revolution, 
Leningrad was a Yid of Eibi Yisrael. There was a lot of Yiddishkeit and a lot of Torah and a lot of Chassidus. Leningrad had a Rav. The old Rav of Leningrad, his name was Katzenelenbergen. He, he was a Yeshish, he was an old man. He was a Rav for a very, very long time. And the, the Friedrich Rebbe had a very interesting relationship with this Katzenelenbergen. At Yes Namisnagid. He was considered not a Chassid. And he, he this Rav Katzenelenbergen had certain tightness to the Friedrich Rebbe. But the Friedrich Rebbe had no tightness to him. <laughs> In other words, he was an older man, and the Friedrich Rebbe felt that he doesn't understand everything that's going on. So he had certain complaints to the Friedrich Rebbe, but the Friedrich Rebbe had no complaints to him. I'll tell you to what extent. Uh, I have a, a neighbor, his name is Hilke Zaltzman, Rav Hilke Zaltzman. He's old enough to be my father, so he's not exactly my friend. But he told me that his father was Rav Ram Zaltzman, and Rav Ram Zaltzman was a sheikhet. And he needed to take uh, Kabbalah for Shechita. He needed to go to a Rav to get Kabbalah for Shechita. So the, this was when the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, was still living in Russia. So the previous Rebbe said to him, so we're going to go get Kabbalah. So he says, there's a Chassidish Rav in Leningrad, Rav Lazarov, Alzarov, I'll go to him, I'll get the Kabbalah for Shechita. So the Friedrich Rebbe says, what about Katzenelleberg, the, the main rabbi in Leningrad, in Petersburg? So he tells the Rebbe, he's a misnagid. I don't want to get Kabbalah from him. So the Rebbe says of it as an El Kharid, he's a, he's a pious Jew, he's a righteous man. So the Rebbe Ram Zaltman says, but he's a misnagid and he goes, I'm a chassid. He's going to test me very hard and I'm going to fail the test. So the Rebbe told him, Vestavis. So you'll know. The Rebbe insisted that he should get Kabbalah from Arab Kassanel. But you know, he went and Itaka gave him a very hard test. And Itaka knew, he knew. He knew, he doesn't know how he knew, but he knew. But he was a very al So when he passed away, when the Catholic Bible passed away, they needed a successor, they needed a new Rav in Leningrad. So there was a, even in those years, there was Baruch Hashem politics. The Chassidim put a candidate, and the Mishnagdim put a candidate, maybe there have been a third candidate also. The candidate the Chassidim put was Lazarov. And the, the Mishnagdim's candidate, I, I forget the name always, and I'm sorry, it's a name that I have to sort of remember. But a Yid, an El Chayid, a Misnagid, a Litvak, that when the Friedrich Rebbe was living in Russia, he was one of the people that the Friedrich Rebbe used to consult about Askonis at that time. So when the, there was a vacancy in the Rabbanus in Leningrad, the Chassidim wanted to have a Chassidim Shadov, and the Misnagid wanted to have a Shadov. And there was a, a campaign, campaigning, campaigning. And then a message came from the Friedrich Rebbe, a message came from the Friedrich Rebbe who was not living in Russia anymore. And the message was that the Chassidim should vote for the Misnagdisha candidate. So that the election was over. <laughs> that was it. But everyone was very surprised. The Chassidim put up a Chassidisha candidate. And the Misnagdim put up a Elamisha candidate. And the previous Rebbe said that the Chassidim should vote for this man. The Rebbe knew him. The Rebbe knew him. And the Rebbe knew that he was a real Jew. And he, he's right to be the Rebbe of Leningrad. So the Hasidim decided that they have to find out who he is. Litois al Kankana. Who is this man who's from the other team? And the Rebbe wants Dafke him. The three the Rebbe wants he should be Rav. So they sent Rab Chaikal Khan and Allah Shalom, who was a Bakr, an elder Bakr, and he was a businessman, to his home. And his, uh, his role was he should knock on the door and he should say that he's passing through Leningrad doing business and he's a place to stay. Would it be okay if he stays with the Rav? He should host him as an Oyrech, as a guest. So the Rav was very happy to invite him in, and he stayed in his home. A couple of days after he arrives, there's a knock on the door, and an elderly Jew, an elderly an elderly Jew comes into his house. And he's very upset. He's crying. He's very upset. And he says to the Rav, he says, Rebbe, I have been through my whole life. I was never Machal Shabbos, I was always Echel Kosher. I behaved as I'm supposed to behave, I read Yiddish Kinder. And now they're telling me that if I don't work Shabbos, they're gonna throw me out of my apartment. I'm gonna live on the street. When the Chalum come in, I'm gonna expire. And I'm not gonna have Panos on that, to be a feed my family. What am I supposed to do? They're forcing me to work Shabbos. So this Rav sat down with this Yid. This is the Soviet Union, 1933, something like that. And he went through all of the shyness, every question that he had about how he went to work and what his work was, and he explained to him the difference between a Deiraisa and a Derabonon, and he talked this Yid through. He said, listen, you should go to work, don't do this, but do this. He, 
he helped him understand that it was possible for him to be from to be Shem Shabbos, and he should be able to show up at work. He says, he's not going to be Machal Shabbos. He, he helped him deal with the technicalities of Shabbos. They should be able to keep his, his, his life and, and, uh, and keep Shabbos. And it was very beautiful, very sensitive, it was very kind. The next day, a Lubavitcher chassid comes in, a Tomim, with the same exact shayla. There was a difference, however. The difference was, he was a Talmud Chach. And he knew all the Hatedim. And he had already worked them out. <laughs> he had them all worked out already. So he came into the Rav, not to ask him what to do, but to present him with all the Hatedim he had come up with, and to get approval that the Rav should agree that the Rav should agree that this is a legitimate way he could be able to keep Shabbos and he shouldn't whatever it loses apartment. I mean, this is real stuff. You know, you and I sit here in Miami Beach and talk, tell such stories. We don't really relate. We don't really relate to the reality of Pekuach Nefesh. And that's what this was. This was Mamish Pekuach Nefesh. So he comes into the same Rav the next day and he t- explains to him, listen, I, this is my job. And if I lose my job, I lose my apartment. If I lose my apartment, I'm not going to have what to eat, and so on and so forth, and have children, and the whole thing. And I, I think this is how I could work it out, that I should not be a Mechal Shabbos. And he presents the Rav with his thoughts. And when he finishes this Rav, and I really wish I remembered his name, says, absolutely not. For me, you're not getting a heter for Koytze Shayud. For me, I'm not going to allow you to make any compromises at all. You, you're a Talmud Chacham, you're a learned man, you seem to have worked it out. He said, but if you're asking me that I should allow you to make these kind of compromises, for me, I'm giving you no hatred. And he was very emphatic, very resolute and very strong. I'm not going to help you do things uh, less than optimally, than the highest level. So this he had left. So after he left, so the Chaykel Khan, who witnessed this, says to the Zerov, last night somebody came in, and he asked him the same question, and you talked him through these hatedim exactly. Today, somebody else comes in with the same exact situation. He says, I'm not helping you. I'm not going to help you find a way out of your dilemma. He says, why? So he says to him like this, Ayid lives in Russia. He's struggling. He wants to be an Elok. Ayid, it's my job to help him. Then he used an expression in Russian. I, 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 but it's not, it's not some, I sat Shabbos in a shul, a Russian guy told me it means something altogether different. But whatever, Kordetsky Corpus, I don't know what those words mean. He said to him, the royal guard, the royal guard, the, the personal guard of the king, there's no compromises. In other words, he said to this, this is Alababa Chachasid, he said. Alababa Chachasid is a Tamim, he's a soldier. He says, for them there's no for them, there's no compromises. This was the story. So the, this was what the Hasidim were trying to find out. What did the Friedrich Rebbe see in this Rav, this, mis, this so-called Misnagde Sharov, that he preferred him over the Hasidim Sharov? And the insight, the boy side, the, what's behind this is that we, we don't know what Mercedes Nefesh is. We really don't. We don't know what Mercedes Nefesh is. We live in America. We have a Mesidus Nefesh, right? Our Mesidus Nefesh, we'll talk about it later, but the, the Mesidus Nefesh that Yidin in Russia had, we don't understand what it means. We, we can't begin to understand what that life is like. And when you're in a circumstance of Mesidus Nefesh, a Rav doesn't only pass him from the book, from the Sefer, from the, from the book. A Rav pass him from his Neshama. Because there are Piskei Din that are not based on the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch doesn't address these kinds of questions. Shekhanach does not have workable solutions. And the, the quality of a Rav under those circumstances is defined not, not only by how much he can learn, but how in touch he is with that other dimension. And the Friedrich Rebbe felt that this Yid appreciates this. And that's why the Friedrich Rebbe wanted people to vote for him. But this is the story. This is the story of... of, of, of of the Fidi Kirab, so Yidin in Russia, Lubavitch in Russia, Anash in Russia, Tmimim in Russia, that there was a circumstance of Mesidus Nefesh, and Mesidus Nefesh, Mesidus Nefesh means that you're figuring out how to be a Jew based on your soul, on your conscience, on your inner self. And that's very, 
what, how do I say this? You know, we, you can be from if, if you know the Shulchan Aruch, you can learn the laws and you can follow the laws. But when there is no laws, and the law has to come from a person's neshama, they have to be in touch with that neshama. And the Friedrich Rebbe obviously was that person. And the Friedrich Rebbe called that out of Chesidim, of Anash, of Tmimim. And when the Friedrich Rebbe was released from prison, he made a yomtif. He made a yomtif because his victory, as he himself wrote in the letter, was not personal. It wasn't he was released from prison. I, I, this is my feeling. I, this may be a, a statement that you're not allowed to say, but this is my feeling. When the Friedrich Rebbe walked out of the Shpalerka prison alive, he was the most surprised man. The Rebbe Rayat, the Friedrich Rebbe, did absolutely nothing to save himself. Nothing. The Friedrich Rebbe did nothing to help himself. The Friedrich Rebbe went to see this Nefesh, he had one direction. He had no idea how it was going to end. One direction. The Amish that saved him. The Amish that saved him. The Friedrich Rebbe did nothing to save himself. Hashem saved his life. And because the previous Rebbe saw that the Amish that saved his life, he understood that this was an act of God to indicate, to say, to reveal, to show that ultimately there's going to be the Dan Natsach, that Yiddishkeit is going to win, and that Chassidus is going to win, and the Eivish is going to win. And that's why you base Thomas as a Yom Tif. So let's say L'chaim, I need a little more from the Seferan. L'chaim, L'bracha, we live in a different world. No, it's fine. We live in a different world. We live in a very, very different world. But we celebrate your base at Gimel Thomas. I'll tell you a story. That the, it's now it's a Lukut Sichas. Dr. Zelikson, Dr. Zelikson got married Chaneke Tovshin Yud Beis. Dr. Zelikson was the Rebbe's doctor. And he was a Kodav, he was related to the Rebbe. And he had a very special relationship with the Rebbe. Dr. Zelikson very special relationship. When I was a child, my, my parents didn't use Dr. Zelikson. My mother was too American with Dr. Zelikson. I didn't know who Dr. Zelikson was. But in 770, there was a Yid who stood a whole day in Davant. A whole day in Davant. He would stand downstairs in Davant. We were children. The doors of 770 were always open. This, I need to tell you this. For those of you who are not old enough, when I was a child, no door in 770 was locked. The only door in 770 was locked was the Rebbe's room. We used to play in the hallway outside the Rebbe's room. We used to run upstairs to the second floor. We used to make ourselves crazy in the elevators. 770 was our home. Later, they had to lock up doors because, of, because they couldn't keep them unlocked. But when I was a child, and even when I was a, after my mitzvah, 770 wasn't locked. So I would open up the door to Ganeid Natach, and that means the room right outside the Rebbe's room, and there was this yid with his glass at the tip of his nose, a whole day thousand film davening. I thought he was a tzaddik nisnei. So that was Dr. Zelikson. <laughs> they would come to 770 in the middle of davening. He would get down parichas. He hadn't dug as a child. I mamish thought he was a tzaddik when I discovered that he was Dr. Zelikson. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, but when Dr. Zelikson got married, the Rebbe was Masad the Kedushin. They officiated at his wedding. And the Rebbe actually went to the hall. In those the Mamish early, early years, the Rebbe did not only do the Siddha Gedushin, he actually went to the hall. I don't know where it was, whether it was Brooklyn or it was Manhattan. And the Rebbe spoke two long sikhs. And when Dr. Zelikson passed away, his son, Machal, Zalzan Gezunt, had seichel. He wrote up the sikhs and he sent them into the Rebbe. And the Rebbe edited the sikhs and he published them in his father's biography. He made a, a biography of his father. And now it's printed in Lukut Sikhis. So the, the, Rebbe, was, the Rebbe spoke about it was Chaneke, Tafshin Yud Bey, he spoke about Mesiris Nefesh. So at the, 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 at the Chupe, at the Chasane, there were Rabbonim who were not Lubavitchers. Dr. Zelikson's wife came from a family of Germanic Jews, Yekesheyin. And she had, uh, I don't know what kind of family she had, but two Rabbonim were sitting at the head table, non Lubavitchers, Litvish Rabbonim, says, Yekesh Rabbanim, Germanic Rabbanim, and the Rebbe talked, and they listened, but they were people, and they made some comments, and the comments are printed in the Sikha. And one of the comments that one of these Rabbanim said to the Rebbe is, Havos read the Rebbe Zeifel Vegem Mesiris Nefesh. Why is the Friedrich Rebbe talking, the Rebbe is an our Rebbe, talking so much about Mesiris Nefesh? Now, I wasn't there, I wasn't even born, but I could understand the question. It was six years after the Holocaust. Now you have to talk about Mesidus Nefesh, you can't find a better topic. So one of these Rabbonim asked the Rebbe, Favos read the Rebbe, Favos read the Rebbe, why is the Lubavitch Rebbe talking about Mesidus Nefesh? So the Rebbe answered him very vaguely. The Rebbe said, 
The Rebbe de Shvel Gezokta was in America that was in America that was in America that was the Rebbe's answer if I remember correctly which means the, the Rebbe de Shvel the Friedrich and Rebbe said in America you have to talk about Mercedes Nefesh that's all the Rebbe said Fosim for Lloyd Pirish but the truth is it says in Tanya in the end of Tanya chapter 25 Perich Chof Hei which is the Perich about Mercedes Nefesh the Alter Rebbe writes that the mitzvah of Shema Yisrael the mitzvah of Shema Yisrael was given the The mitzvah every day say Shema Yisrael was given to the Yidin who going into Eretz Yisrael. So the Alter Rebbe asked this question: Shema Yisrael is Mesiris Nefesh. Shema Yisrael is connected to Mesiris Nefesh. The Yidin going into Eretz Yisrael were not facing Mesiris Nefesh. The pasuk says Pachtachem Umerachem Yitan Avaya. Yidin are going to go into Eretz Yisrael and they're going to be powerful and independent and sovereign and strong and wealthy. So the Alter Rebbe asks, why is Moshe giving the mitzvah of Mesidas Nefesh to a generation of Jews who are not going to know Mesidas Nefesh? That was the Alter Rebbe's question. Alter Rebbe gave a profound answer. A generation of Jews that has Mesidas Nefesh doesn't have to talk about it. They live it. A generation of Jews that doesn't have Mesidas Nefesh, that their life is good, they have to talk about Mesidas Nefesh. Why do you have to talk about Mesiris Nefesh and Mesiris Nefesh is not realistic? Because talking about Mesiris Nefesh affects the way we keep Taylor Mitzvahs under all conditions. It's one of the most important messages in the Tanya. That a person could use Mesiris Nefesh as a motivator for every day. So we sit here in America, we talk about what happened in a different time, in a very different time, in a very different place. And we, I suppose we could say, we thank God that we live in the country in which we live, but the Abisha doesn't change, and Taylor doesn't change, and Yiddish guy doesn't change, and the motivation that we need to be Yidden and Hasidim is still real. And talking about Mesidus Nefesh helps. L'chaim. 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 L'chaim.